she warned me about this. She said this was going to happen. She told me it would. I've been left behind. Richard, I wish I could say this is just one incident, but it isn't. Everyone, it seems, has lost someone. I know I have. I know we will be telling you this a lot today, but this next scene is terrific. Out on one particularly hard-hit area of the interstate, this man saw his wife and children disappear and literally went insane. Police were there to control a mass shootout, but everyone just stopped when this man literally set himself on fire. It somehow captured the futility they all felt. The futility and terror we all feel. For World News Network, I'm Julie James. Now over to videographer Jim Walker, who's been standing by in the downtown area. Pandemonium is the only way to describe the scene here. People have basically just gone crazy and run out onto the streets in a state of panic. The corner of Main and Broad, usually a quiet main place, is typical of the city and world gone mad. This scene on Cooper Street is an example of thousands of small accidents. People have vanished. But as you're seeing, your vehicles have it. All over the city, the story is the same. Motor vehicles on fire, in accidents, and like this bus, abandoned when the driver disappeared. We now have confirmation that for security reasons, the president is aboard Air Force One, and he is due to... We now have a radio transmission from the President. My fellow Americans and citizens of the world, we don't know what we are dealing with here in this time of trial for our budding world community. One thing is certain, whatever it is, it knows no borders. We shall have to face this together as passengers aboard Spaceship Earth. As I speak these words, the Pentagon, NATO, and the joint UN forces are being mobilized. Aircraft across the globe from many nations are airborne and have assumed defensive positions. Radar and top secret new tracking technologies are covering every area of the sky and sophisticated communication systems are seeking any communication that may be taking place. We have also launched two space shuttles to join Explorer, which is already in orbit. Explorer, which has been in orbit with this entire disaster, reports monitoring no unusual phenomena. I have spoken with the leaders of the leading nations. Some others, unfortunately, are missing. And due to the global nature of this crisis, we are convinced that this is not the result of a new weapon. Instead, we are facing something new, something that our old ways of thinking never prepared us for. Let us look within ourselves, draw upon our great human spirit, and come together in the oneness of this challenge as members of the human family. Finally, I must take this opportunity to tell whoever or whatever is responsible for this act that we seek communication and understanding. We are a peace-loving people. Seek only to grow and learn. We pose no threat. We await your communication. The situation certainly defies conventional explanations. Reporter Mark Parsons has been collecting information from various sources and filed this global report. With the sudden disappearance of literally millions of people, the entire planet is experiencing fear and confusion. Tears are flowing and tempers are flaring as people search for answers. Looting and rioting is rampant everywhere. The police simply cannot deal with the magnitude of panic that exists. Fires burn out of control in homes, apartments, and factories where it is suspected that the sudden vanishing of people everywhere has resulted in everything from stoves to welding torches being left unattended. This filling station was destroyed when an unmanned vehicle collided with the pumps. Highways are plugged with accidents caused by moving vehicles whose drivers seem to have just disappeared. Seventeen people were killed on a mountain road in Venezuela after the driver of this bus simply ceased to exist. This Boeing 747 crashed just after takeoff from Cairo when the pilot and co-pilot suddenly vanished. 
Another aircraft was seen plummeting to the ground in England. No pilot was seen ejecting, and no body was found. Two helicopters collided over an airbase in the Philippines as their blades touched after one of the pilots vanished. Fear has launched the greatest mobilization of military force that the world has ever seen. All over the world, skies are filled with fighter aircraft patrolling their respective borders. Military sources have reported that all nations are at their highest states of readiness, but against an undefined enemy. As you must be aware of by now, today at 4.59 Eastern Time, millions of people disappear simultaneously all over the world without warning and without explanation, initiating a disaster of global proportions. Our communication center Dallas is still experiencing technical problems, We're trying to restore some of our satellites that have been temporarily offline. Fortunately, due to the new global communication system, we should be able to reroute them soon. Bear with us as we continue to try to bring you updates on the latest events around the world. As I've said, we're trying to find an explanation for an event is just in. There's possibly an explanation that has yet been unaccounted for here in the United States. We have one of our foreign correspondents standing by in Rome. We're going to Rome right now. As time is passing since the vanishing, a consensus is rising that this may be an event that has spiritual implications that were spoken of in the Bible. I have with me Bishop Messager. Bishop, can you explain any of this? Today, the human race has grown up. We have entered the age spoken of in the scriptures and recorded on the cornerstone of the United Nations where it says, All will dwell secure, and none shall make them afraid. It may not seem like that now, because evolution is never easy. It is always chaotic as the old dies away to make way for the new. Are you suggesting that those people who have vanished have something in common? The Bible a work which always speaks of the ultimate triumph of the human spirit, told us that one day the tares would be removed from the wheat so that the wheat could grow. Today, we have fulfilled that prophecy. We must come together now in one faith that recognizes the beauty and fragility of Mother Earth. The age of destruction and division is gone. The age of peace and unity is here. Our thanks to our foreign affiliates for that seed. We'll try and stay in touch with them as we attempt to understand and find an explanation for what has happened. Ronald Weston is standing by in London. Ronald, how are the people in Britain dealing with all of this? How are they dealing with the disappearance of literally millions of people? What possible explanations do they have? I have with me Professor Thornton from the Sociology Department of Oxford. He has dedicated his entire life to the study of social evolution. Professor, what happened today? Well, I was able to hear Bishop Messenger a moment ago, and I agree with him. What the people spoke about concerning human evolution has been broken up. The great thing is of all religions. The fact is, well, this is starting. Let us get started. This is not what we're surprised about. In fact, this is the next step in the social evolution. Bishop Messager made mention of the same thing. But how does this tie in with evolution? No. Do you think evolution was something that happened in a rainforest somewhere a million years ago? Evolution, by its very nature, is an ongoing process. This step in evolution is the final one of human experience. And what has just occurred all over the world was not physical evolution, but spiritual. Don't you We are gone. We are now going back to Arthur Plaza. Arthur, is there any news from the management of the nuclear plant? Richard, we, we still have this, no official information, but we sense that the seriousness of the situation seems to be escalating. The military has been mobilized in the immediate area, and we've seen evidence of blockade being put up. Yeah. And this is probably the our last transition from this area. Back to you. Arthur, for your own sake,
for your own safety. For God's sake, get out of there. We'll wait to hear from you. Thank you, Arthur. I've been told that just moments ago, we established a live link to NASA's mission control in Houston. Good day, ladies and gentlemen. Earlier today, the crew aboard Space Shuttle Explorer confirmed visual contact with one, possibly two objects of some kind. Further observations have confirmed that although we are uncertain of its origin, it is definitely not a craft of our own. We now have a radio contact with Explorer. Establish that feed. We do have a remote camera access to a special emergency assembly. The leaders of the European Union. It seems we're also having some technical trouble with our connection there. No, just push it through. Just push it through. We'll take what you've got. <clears throat> Ladies and gentlemen, please excuse these technical difficulties. It seems one of our cameras has gone out. Oh, here we are. Here we are. They told us there was a God who would protect us from the unknown. But where is that God? There is no such God. What there is, it's us, proud, strong, and capable of meeting the challenges of a new era. The time has come to look not beyond ourselves but to ourselves, those who clung to the old ways are gone. They were incapable of making the change, of taking the next step. Their vision was not of this earth, so they have been removed from it. But you have the power you are able. You are chosen. I will lead you. I will show the powers that lie within you. It is for this moment that I have come to you. I will lead you into an age of peace and love unlike anything you ever imagined. I will teach you the way of divinity because you are the power, you are the glory forever and ever. Amen. There is one way in one world, together we will take the challenge. Hello, I'm Paul Lalonde, co-host of This Week in Bible Prophecy. What you've just seen is a dramatization of what we think the news may have looked like in very recent days. You see, the world you're sitting in right now is a completely different world than the one I'm sitting in recording this message. An event the Bible calls the rapture has taken place, and millions or even billions of people have vanished from the face of the earth, including myself and all of the men you're going to see on this video today. You know, while we can't begin to imagine what the world you're sitting in right now must be like, we can at least say we knew this was going to happen, and we can answer many of the questions that are so important to you right now. We're going to hear from some of the top experts in the study of Bible prophecy. My brother Peter Lalonde, Hal Lindsey, John Walbert, John Ankerberg, Dave Breed, and Zola Levin. These men are going to help give you an understanding of what has taken place and answer many of your questions. So without further delay, 
here's Peter Lalonde with a message to those who have been left behind. As Paul said, we can't even imagine the world that you're living in today. We can understand some of the facts. We understand what's taken place, that millions of people have vanished off the face of this earth. We can understand what some of the reaction will be, as we've shown in this dramatization, made before the event ever took place. But what we can't understand is what you must be going through right now. The terror and the panic and the fear that must be in your life. This is something that we can't comprehend. We think about it and we think that maybe by this point in time, millions of people have literally gone insane from the fear and the terror and the panic. Husbands who've lost wives, wives who've lost husbands, some have lost children, grandchildren, and a great fear has come upon this earth. And the logical question that comes up is, who's next? Who's going to be taken next? Because if you weren't watching this tape, you wouldn't know if this was a one-time event or just the beginning of something that we can't comprehend. However, I'm speaking to you as a Christian, and I believe I will be gone by the time you see this tape. And if the event that has taken place is indeed the one we're talking about, and it is, we can get some information as to what's taking place in this world from the Word of God. The Word of God tells us some things that take place at the exact same time as this mass disappearance. The first thing that tells us is that at this point in time, the restraining influence of the Holy Spirit has been removed from this earth. That which restrained evil for these thousands of years has now been taken out of the way that evil can have its free run for the next seven year period. At the same time, seducing spirits unlike anything the world has ever seen have been released to literally seduce and deceive the people who live on this earth, to make them believe a lie, to make them have an understanding of what has taken place and what will take place that is not the truth. And what is more important than anything right now is to have an understanding of what is true and what is false in these times. I would assume that there's a lot of fear. There is a lot of tension. I would assume that newscasters are speculating as to the disappearance of millions and millions of people on planet Earth. You are wondering what's going to take place next. I would refer you to the Bible. The Bibles are still left all over the world. As I mentioned before, we are Christians. People who believe in Jesus Christ and we have vanished off the face of this earth. And the Bible predicted it. I want to show you some of the scriptures right now that spoke of this great event to show you that indeed the Bible did tell us this was going to come to pass and this is how we knew that it would take place. The first place I want to look at is in the Gospel of John, the 14th chapter. And you have a situation here where the disciples are concerned that Jesus is leaving them. He's on this earth, it's 2,000 years ago, and he's saying, I have to go now, and the disciples are sad to see him go. And he says, let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you, I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself, that where I am, there ye may also be. That is the hope that Christ gave to all believers of him during the period of grace, that he would indeed come back one day and take us to be where he is. That is exactly what has taken place right now. Well, the true believers have just been taken out, as uh, <coughs> Christians used to tell you they were. And uh, they've all been suddenly, without warning, snatched out to be Christ in the air, and they've been changed from mortal to immortal. Where did they go? They went to heaven. Their lives are now a beautiful fulfillment of the promise of Jesus Christ when he said, I go to prepare a place for you, and if I go, I will come again to receive you unto myself, that where I am, there you may be also. You can be in heaven one day if you know God's Son as personal Savior, and the great transition will be the rapture of the church. You see, when you think of the second coming of Christ that you may have heard about, you thought, he was coming right back to this earth. That doesn't happen for another seven years. Instead, first he caught us up to be with him in the clouds. We'll look at one more verse of scripture just to prove how the Bible told us that this day would come. 1 Corinthians chapter 15. In verse 51, the Apostle Paul, writing about 2,000 years ago, said, Behold, I show you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, or we shall not all die, but we shall all be changed in a moment. In the twinkling of an eye, at the last trump, for the trumpet shall sound, and the dead shall be raised incorruptible, and we shall be changed. The proof is in the pudding. The Bible did indeed tell us that this event was going to take place, and as I've said before, we knew in advance that this was going to happen. Now one of the things that we know as we sit and contemplate this event, which we can only do so vaguely, is understand that through the seduction and the deception that is coming upon this earth, 
other explanations will be given for what's taken place here. And as we sit and ponder that, we think about if the rapture took place in the world in which we live today, the one frame of reference that most people would have for this event came from something that's been very popular in this world for the last decade or so. It's called Star Trek, and it's called the transporter beam, being the up sky. So stories will begin to explode that people have been taken off this planet on UFOs, that they've been sent to other planets to slave planets, or that they have just been brought up to the UFO for some reason or another. This is simply not true according to the scripture. It's a lie that we know is forthcoming. Others may say that what we are witnessing here is a new technology that mankind has invented. Once again, it's not true. It's the event that the Bible took place. There are new agers who exist in the world today who will say what has taken place here is that there has been a next step of evolution. You see in these last moments before the rapture, the debate about evolution isn't about evolution from the slime any longer. It is about the fact that if evolution is ongoing, it means not only was there evolution in the past, but there will be evolution in the future. And many of those within the New Age belief system say that the next step of evolution will not be physical, but spiritual. And those people who stand in the way of this great evolution where man realizes the power he has within himself, those who stand in the way and who oppose that will be taken out of the way. In other words, what they'll say is, yes, indeed, perhaps it is the Christians who have been taken out of the way, but it's because they've been taken out of the way because they're bad people, not because they were believers in Christ. Because they stand in the way of the evolution that mankind must take. You know, these are only some of the ideas of the explanations that will be given as to where we have gone. We can't even begin to imagine what they will be because they will be so clever, so brilliant, so wisely constructed that it will sound to you like this is a perfect explanation of what has taken place. Right now, I would expect that there will be one man that either someplace in Europe, uh, one of the countries there, will start to have the word that other people will listen to. I would caution you about this man. Whoever it is, he'll probably be a very smart person. This man is going to be, without doubt, the greatest leader from the world you want that they've ever seen. And he will certainly come in with things that sound uh, like the answer, and many of them will be the answer. He will have some true solutions that will be supernatural. They will be uh, amazingly cunning at solving some of the sticky problems of ethnic uh, conflicts and so forth. And uh, this leader will be successful because he will have a vast network of spiritual beings working on his side, inside of these people, to cause them to go along with his plans. But from a standpoint of God's truth, this man is not what he appears to be. He's going to be, uh, he will turn out to be the most disastrous figure this world has ever known. The Bible has always called him the Antichrist. He will be easily identified in some outstanding characteristic as the engineering of the seven year peace covenant with Israel. And he uh, will be at first uh, seen to be a peacemaker, uh, <coughs> acceptable to all nations. Israel, I think, will have to deal with him. Uh, there will be a tight spot as they are now. We're seeing this being set up. People riding up with peace. And uh, this uh, characteristic of him will be that he has the allegiance of mercy for all nations, and he uh, has his able to persuade protection. Today we don't know who this Antichrist character is. By the time you're watching this, on the other side of the rapture, you will have a very good idea because he has arisen onto the world scene just shortly after this event takes place. We know that he will be able to recognize him because one of the first things that he will do is sign a treaty guaranteeing the protection of Israel in some manner. It may just be a localized treaty with Israel and her neighbors, but more likely it is going to be a treaty, the constitution of planet Earth, the bringing together of all mankind. But Israel and a treaty guaranteeing her protection for seven years is at the very center of this whole thing. He's given granted several titles in the Bible. We sometimes refer to the Antichrist. Actually, the Bible doesn't use that term concerning him, so he is the Antichrist. They call him the man of sin or the lawless one. They call him the king, Daniel 11, verse 36. He's the, one of the heads of the beast out of the sea in Revelation 13. To sum it up, he's the world dictator. Some things we know about this leader are very, very clear. 
In fact, according to the scriptures, looking at Revelation chapter 13, we can tell you that this man is not arising to take political control of the world or economic control of the world. This is all a religious issue. He is here to oppose God. He is here to fight against God. Indeed, the scriptures tell us that the first words that will arise out of his mouth, when, come out of his mouth when he arises onto the world scene, is great words against God. The first thing that he's going to do is rally the troops, get everyone together in a hatred towards God on this earth. If we know what we're talking about, you will know that that is what this leader is saying now that he has arisen onto the scene. These are the very first words that come out of his mouth, is his hatred against God. That should give you a clue that this is not about politics or about economics, this is about religious deception. Another thing we know is that when the serpent told the lie to Eve in the Garden of Eden, he said to Eve, Surely God hath not said, he discounted what God had said in the word of God that we're trying to explain to you now. And at the same time he said, Eve, you shall be as gods. This is the law you're going to hear in the days ahead. That you have taken this step of evolution. That these new powers exist in the world today because mankind is evolving to the next level. And that indeed, you don't need some god out there to rescue you. You just have to discover the divinity that is within yourself. But I believe that uh, if we look at the Bible, we'll see that it predicted the merging of religions together, and that is going to be a way of centralizing and controlling man's very fate, and, and uh, that is going to keep us from ever coming to the truth. So I know it will be hard to resist, but resist you must, and here we're going to have eternal life. It's true that all the religions of the world, regardless of whether Christian or non-Christian, are going to be abolished by law, and everyone will be required to worship Satan and the world ruler. And those who won't will be beheaded, they'll be executed. It is interesting to note that the Antichrist does have a partner. His name is the false prophet. The Antichrist will be especially adept at setting up a world government, but he wants to invoke the religions of the world to come and to stand with him. And so he chooses someone whom he makes a great religious leader. In fact, that person may already be a great religious leader. And that person is able to produce such magnetism of religious interest to the Antichrist that finally he will make all the world fall down and worship him. In verse 16, speaking of the false prophet, it says, And he, the false prophet, causeth all, both small and great, rich and poor, free and bond, to receive a mark in their right hand or in their foreheads, and that no man might buy or sell, save he that had the mark, or the name of the beast, or the number of his name. Here is wisdom. Let him that hath understanding count the number of the beast, for it is the number of a man, and his number is six hundred, three score, and six. At this time, there is no firm opinion here of what this 666 stands for, what this number means. It is certainly the number of man, and three, six is the number of man, and three is one of the numbers of God, so 666 is man making himself God, but perhaps you will have much more wisdom on that and you'll be able to identify how this number lines up on the side of the rapture on which you live. What do we know about this allegiance system that you're hearing so much and that is required to be a part of the system? The Bible does teach that the Antichrist will have an amazing organizational system and he'll be able to sustain this because he has an information retrievable thing so that he can know every person in the world and that person can be individually identified by some mark that is put upon him. Once this was thought impossible, but now we live in a time in which it is possible with barcodes and related things to mark anything or really anybody. Yes, one can put out his hand under a scanner and be instantly identified with a computer capability that could tell the story of his whole life. He will be a part of the organization of the Antichrist. The Bible anticipated this in Revelation chapter 13, verses 17 and 18. It talked about the fact that the whole world would be reduced to one economic control, and that once that's established, this great leader in Rome will demand that everyone receive a mark, a number. Everyone will have their own individual number 
but they must swear allegiance to the new government and especially allegiance to this new leader. This is a mark of allegiance to the beast. This is not just about a new world order. It's not about people uniting. It is taking the mark in allegiance to this beast. It's a system that will lock out all dissidents. Anyone who does not agree with this system, anyone who does not agree with the philosophies and the religious be beliefs of the beast, anyone who does not toe the line will be locked out and will not be allowed to even buy or sell anything. Why should I not join such an organization? Well, the Bible says everyone who receives the mark of the beast will not be able to be saved. He will have cut off the possibility of salvation. The Antichrist is the ultimate embodiment of evil. Therefore, even though it will cost the lives of believers in that time, they should stand against the religion and the government of the Antichrist because the cost really has to do with eternal destiny. It's interesting. This couldn't have happened in any other time other than the technology-ridden age in which we and you now live in. You will know by now, of course, that this thing is not about economics. This thing is not about buying and selling. This is about allegiance. This is about religious worship. You know, if you turn over in your Bibles to Revelation chapter 14, you will see a verse 9, and the third angel followed them, saying with a loud voice, If any man worship the beast in his image, and receive his mark in his forehead or in his hand, the same shall drink of the wine of the wrath of God, which is poured out without mixture into the cup of his indignation. What an incredible statement this is. If you receive this mark, you will drink of the wine of the wrath of God. There is no salvation after taking this mark. Why? Because this is a spiritual decision. You have to choose right now who you're going to serve. You have to choose which direction you're going to go. You have to make an eternal decision. And taking this mark is a decision in the wrong way. This is about allegiance. This is about making a decision for your soul. The Bible also says that these will just be ways that the new political leader will use to try and deceive the world into following him. You say, well, how can I stay out of it? You can stay out of it by, first of all, realizing that the events that have already taken place, Jesus Christ said they would take place. The Bible predicted them to come about, and they have started to come about. If that's true, and it has happened, then the fact is that you need to put your faith in Jesus Christ and start to look at the rest of the things that he said will come about in a very short period of time. Believe him. Ask yourself, how could the Bible have known about these things before they took place? Why does the Bible put a completely different interpretation on these events when things look so good right now? Again, I'm not here. I've been raptured. I've been taken away according to what Jesus Christ has already said. Now, if Jesus has been correct in all of those areas, then why not trust him in what he says is coming next? Don't be taken in by the philosophy of the New World Order. Don't be taken in by the miraculous signs that are being done. Don't be taken in by the fact of the promises of peace and prosperity. The other thing to remember as you're watching this and you say, how do I believe that these guys really have the answer here? Remember, we're telling you this is going to happen long before it's happened. And the very events we're going to tell you about are events that you're going to see come to pass before you. So while we may not have all the details exactly right, and we may not understand the time, it's hard for us to see into it right now. The Word of God has painted a picture that you're going to find incredibly revealing in the days ahead. A lot of people don't realize the devil is a supernatural thing. But if you know in advance what he's going to do, he's going to bring fire down from heaven. He's going to have an idol of himself in the temple. It's going to seem to be alive. And all of this seems to be quite miraculous. And a lot of people will believe it because they want to believe instead of believing in Jesus Christ. This is a time of great tribulation. Actually, the Bible talks about a seven-year period from the book of Daniel, uh, chapter 9, where during the seven-year period that uh, world events are going to take place and God's going to wrap up history. As Paul mentioned to you right off the top of this presentation, this is not about the details. We simply don't have the time to lay out all of the details. But if you will take a careful look, as has been mentioned by some of the other men who worked together with us on this project, read carefully Revelation 6 to 19. Read Matthew 24, Mark 13, Luke 21. Read the book of Daniel. Read Ezekiel chapters 37, 38, and 39. You're going to get an overview of the events taking place and some specific details. 
You see, the Bible is not vague on what's taking place in the world in which you live right now. Instead, it gives great, great detail that you're going to be able to see and understand in a way that we can, because it'll be unfolding right before you. The first three and a half years seem peaceful. Uh, the world's going along with the system. It's working more or less like uh, in, in these trees on the uh, But uh, at the black I think that this treaty will not only involve Israel and those few nations around her, but I think it will be a treaty of the whole planet Earth, a treaty of this new world order, but with Israel very much at the center, but of this we're not certain. We do know that from then for the next three and a half years, a halfway mark of this seven-year tribulation period will be a time of peace where mankind seems to be coming together in unity. But at the three and a half year mark, there's an event that we know takes place and one that may take place there. We're just not certain as we study the scripture on the timing. One thing that may take place at this time is there is going to be at some point an invasion of Israel by a great confederacy led by the Russians from the north of Israel. And they are going to invade and attack Israel to try to destroy Israel. And as they do so, God himself is going to intervene and rescue Israel. Somehow 80% of that Russian confederacy is going to be wiped out. And you know what? The whole world is going to know at that point that it is God who has saved Israel. Now, whether it happens at the midpoint of the tribulation, I'm not sure. But it seems to make sense to me because then at the three and a half year point, the thing that we do know happens is that the Antichrist, this beast, goes into the temple yeah. in Israel and declares that he is God. This is the first time that he makes such a forward and straightforward declaration and says, I am God, I am the only true God. I think the uh, Israelis, by and large, will take Jesus' advice and flee into the hills of Judea and so on. In other words, a man in Jerusalem and the man in the temple of the Antichrist when it's hopelessly desecrated. Now the wrath of God begins to fall upon this earth. And during this final three and a half year period, we're going to see increasing rebellion. Though there's going to be more and more judgments falling upon this earth, and though the earth knows that the judgments are coming from God, the world's heart is going to become more and more hardened to God. Until ultimately we have all of the nations of the world gathering together, together in the Middle East, much like they did to confront Saddam Hussein in the early 1990s. This time they're going to all gather together as this new world order has gained its teeth, as a world police force has come together to push Israel into the sea. This will take a three and a half year period of maneuvering and so on that's taking place, great judgments falling upon this earth, and it ends at what is known as the Battle of Armageddon. Now on this side of the rapture, when people talk about the Battle of Armageddon, they understand it as a great war between communism or capitalism, or they understand it as a great war between the nations of this earth. And to a degree, Armageddon starts out that way. But what happens is absolutely phenomenal. As all these nations gather to push Israel into the sea to do what this Russian confederacy could not do before them, what takes place then is the Lord himself returns to the skies. This is absolutely phenomenal. You now see the Lord in the skies, and you know the whole world, all the people who have taken the mark, all of the people who are in this world will actually see the Lord in the skies. And you know what? Those of us who left at the beginning of the tribulation period in this catch point will be returning with him. This is the second coming of Christ. And all the people standing on this earth see him. There's no doubter. There's no atheist. There's no agnostic then. There he is. And yet what takes place is a statement about what this whole time you're living in is. Because now... The people on this earth, instead of saying, oh God, forgive us, we didn't have faith, they turn their weapons and try to blow the Lord out of the sky. That is how this seven-year period is going to end, with mankind and the beast and the kings of the earth all gathered to make war with Jesus when he returns. This is what this new world order is all about. The world's great tribulation is going to end with the second coming of Christ. He's going to put to death all the wicked that oppose him and bring in his kingdom of righteousness and peace for a thousand years. Satan will be bound and the demon world will be inactive. At the end of the thousand years, Satan is loosed again. Immediately there is rebellion among some who seem to be followers of Christ and were actually born again. They'll be destroyed by fire from heaven. Then our present earth and heaven is destroyed completely by fire and a new heaven, new earth created in the new heaven, new earth, strictly in the new earth, will be the new Jerusalem, the heavenly city, the huge city, where the saints of all ages will dwell for eternity. This is where we're heading, but Jesus will come back and set up his kingdom on this earth and make his judgments and judge those who have taken the mark and so on and establish a 1,000 year period of peace. If you survive through this seven year period, if it does not cost you your life to stand for Christ in this period, you will enter that 1,000 year period. 
But there's also something else. I want to take a look at Revelation chapter 24 because this is very much about what your future has to say. Revelation chapter 20. The fourth verse says, And I saw the thrones, and they that sat upon them, and judgment was given unto them. And I saw the souls of them that were beheaded for the witness of Jesus, and for the word of God, and which had not worshipped the beast, neither his image, neither had received his mark upon their foreheads or in their hands. And they lived and reigned with Christ a thousand years. Even if you don't make it through this seven-year period of time, you will be resurrected to reign with Christ through this thousand-year period. There is a great hope that lies ahead for you. This seven-year period is just a short period of time of great trials and tribulation, and we've tried to just give you some of the details. But hold fast for God. He will take you through. And either way, if you stand strong for God, eternity lies ahead after this short time of trouble. If I was to say to you, you can have prestige worldwide for 24 hours, you can be a billionaire and spend all the money that you possibly could for a 24 year, a 24 hour period of time. And then at the end of the 24 hours, that you would be put into jail for the rest of your life, that you would be tortured, your family would be taken away, and the fact is your reputation would be dragged through the mud. You could either choose that scenario to have the fame, the popularity, the money now, and then be put in jail the rest of your life, or the opposite would be that for 24 hours you could be put into jail, that you could be tortured, that you would have your name dragged through the mud. But after 24 hours, you'd be taken out of jail, you'd be taken away from that, and your name would be spread across the papers of the world, and you would be made famous. You would have been given billions of dollars, and you could spend it for the rest of your life if you have the choice of the two scenarios, which choice would you take? They say, well, everybody would take the second choice. Everybody would say, look, hey, if I, it's only 24 hours, put me in jail. The fact is, that's okay. Whatever I have to endure, fine. The fact is, I, as long as I can have the rest of my life, I can be a billionaire and have all the fame and prestige. That's what I'll choose. What I'm saying is choose that in spiritual terms right now. It might cost you your life to follow Christ at this present time and turn down the new world system. It's only a short time in terms of eternity. And Jesus Christ says, if you'll believe in him now, he'll give you all of eternity and you'll be a child of the king. I would say believe in Christ. If I was to sit here right now and say to you that I had any understanding whatsoever of what you're going through and what is going through your mind and the state that you're in, I would be absolutely lying to you. There's no way I can begin to conceive or perceive anything about the world in which you live and the terrible time which it is. But I know what God knows. I have already met Jesus and I know that whatever the trials are, whatever it is you're up against right now, He is greater than those trials. When you believe the gospel today, you are a part of a marvelous but mysterious entity called the body of Christ. And the body of Christ is entered into by all who believe in Jesus as their personal Savior now. If you believe that Christ is the Son of God, that he died for your sins on Calvary's cross, you have everlasting life. You are saved. You are a member of the body of Christ. You know John, the book of John, the Gospel of John, chapter 3, verse 16, is a scripture so well known. It says, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. What a fantastic promise that is. You don't have to do anything great. You just have to believe God in the midst of what you're going through right now. If you find yourself here on this planet at a time when millions of people suddenly disappear, and you find that people who disappeared were all Christian, then the first thing you need to do is go to God and just say, I missed it. I didn't believe in Jesus Christ at a time when I could have been part of this group that went to meet him. But it's not too late right now. Pray and ask Jesus Christ to come into your life and accept the gift of pardon he died to give you. You must be ready to resist the tremendous pressures that are going to come upon you because the whole world is going to be united in one religion which will be totally committed to wipe out all Christians. And the Antichrist himself will have this fiendish plan of revealing who's a Christian or not by forcing everyone to swear allegiance to him 
unless you swear allegiance to him, you will not get the number validated by which you can buy, sell, or hold a job. So your faith is going to be tested as never before Christians faith have been tested. But be faithful to them. God says you will be saved. Romans chapter 10 says, If thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus Christ and shalt believe in thine heart that God has raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. You can see that on your screen right now. John tells us later, if we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. That's what the power of this thing is all about. Just make a decision to believe God, and God will do the rest, even in the midst of much trouble. Well, of course, the first thing to do is to receive Christ as your Savior. By that I mean you accept Him as the Son of God who died on the cross for your sins and rose again. And if you do that, Christ said, Him that cometh unto me, I will in no wise cast out. God will save you and cause you to be born again. You're going to be a Christian. And then when the rapture occurs, you're going to go to heaven. Now, if you are a Christian living before the rapture, then the challenge is also to live for Christ while you're here. Fill your life with things that count for eternity. Because after the rapture, we're going to be judged with the judgment seat of Christ. Not because we're lost, but because we are saved. And we have to give an account of what God has committed to us to do in this world. The fact of the matter is, we knew that when we made this presentation, there would be some of you on this side of the rapture who are watching. Now, up until this point, we have talked to those who are on the other side of the rapture, and indeed, that is primarily what this presentation has been made for. However, we knew that many of you would be watching on this side. And I also know that many of you who will be watching have not made a decision for Christ, and we were concerned about that. Don't wait with the expectation of being saved during the tribulation. If you know the gospel and you wait, you may come under the formula that says, He that being oft reproved, hardeneth his neck, shall suddenly be cut off and that without remedy. Don't wait until, until the tribulation. We thank God that the door to salvation will be open by believing the gospel of the kingdom during the tribulation, but it is not wise to say, I'll wait until then. To come under the dreadful persecution of the Antichrist will be an awful experience. You can be saved forever, and you can avoid that persecution by believing in Jesus as your Savior now. I pray that you will. I'm looking at the book of 2 Thessalonians, and you can look this up in your Bible. It talks about the rise of the Antichrist in the last days, of this great leader that's going to come upon the world scene. You see in verse 8 of 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, And then shall that wicked be revealed, speaking of this great leader, whom the Lord shall consume with the spirit of his mouth, and shall destroy with the brightness of his coming, even him whose coming is after the working of Satan, with all power and signs and lying wonders and with all deceivableness of unrighteousness in them that perish, because they received not the love of the truth, that they might be saved. And for this God, cause, God shall send them a strong delusion that they should believe a lie. Let me continue. That they all might be damned who believe not the truth, but had pleasure in unrighteousness. You see, there are those on this side of the rapture who know the truth, and yet receive not the love of the truth. This scripture says that God will send those people a delusion that they will not receive the truth on the other side. So despite the fact that you'll see all these things come to pass on the other side, you still won't believe. You have to make a decision today. Will you receive the truth? Because this could be your last opportunity. I don't think, according to this scripture, that if you understand what the truth is today and you reject it, that you will have the opportunity necessarily to be saved on the other side. It's a very dangerous time. No, we should not wait on it all. The Lord can come at any moment. Before I finish, imminent, Paul's time is imminent in our time. The imminency of the rapture is established. It cannot follow some other event, some other prophetic event before the rapture. I can't sit and wait for Christ to sign up the time of the rapture. I would have seen too many miles. The rapture is given as a surprise. The Lord described it as lightning across the sky twinkling of an eye. Those are things you can't forget. So if it is sudden shock like that, uh, then it's, you, you can't follow another event. It's going to come all by itself. So there's, there's, can you wait? No, you cannot wait. Uh, say the decision is to come to Christ and come. I'm going to take a second right now. We're going to put it up on the screen. 
and we're going to read a prayer for you. We're going to say a prayer, and we ask you to pray it along, and this prayer will set your eternal destiny and put you in heaven. But let me say something first. This is not about repeating some words. This is not some magic act that if you repeat the right words in the right order, salvation will be yours. It is saying these words, believing with all of your heart, and asking with all of your heart and all of your soul. When you pray in that manner, then God will hear and receive this prayer. Dear Father in heaven, I realize that I am a sinner and worthy of the fires of hell. At this moment, I confess my sins and ask you to forgive me for my rebellion against you and my refusal to accept the love of Christ. I accept the sacrifice that your son Jesus made for me on Calvary's cross. I believe that you raised him from the dead and I confess with my mouth that Jesus is my Lord. Thank you for hearing this prayer and accepting me into the family of God because of the blood of Christ that covers my sins. And I know from this moment on, I am saved. Thank you, Lord. This is what this whole thing is about. This has not been to show you the great knowledge that we have of the end times events. We can't even really understand what they will be like fully. But God has told us enough to let us know what is coming upon this world. But let me leave you with a thought, both of you on this side of the rapture and those on the other. God said something fantastic in the book of Jeremiah. He said, I know the thoughts that I think toward you. Thoughts of peace and not of evil to bring you to an expected end. Now is the time to walk hand in hand with Christ as never before. And for those of us who had an understanding and experience with this, we can tell you it is the best decision you will ever make regardless of the times in which you live. Eternity lies ahead. Choose you this day whom you will serve.